that's uh, another one of these lovely records from the uh, International Educational Society. Uh, the series was designed to uh, send around the world and share uh, aspects of uh, Britishness and uh, literature and science. And uh, this one is uh, Latin pronunciation by Professor R.S. Conway, uh, who was uh, the professor of Latin Victoria University in Manchester. Now you could uh, think, well this is going to be a bit boring, isn't it? I'm not a Latin scholar, but believe me, this is not designed for Latin scholars, this is designed to share the wonders of uh, language with us ordinary folks. And uh, you'll find something else. Uh, if you're a fan of the, uh, the film uh, uh, Goodbye Mr Chips with uh, Robert Donat, you might remember he said, I never could work out the difference between Cicero and Cicero. Have a listen to this, because by the time you finish this, uh, this two series of records, it's two times uh, 78 RPM shellac records, you'll, you'll know the answer to that question. Studying any language, the first thing to learn is how to pronounce it. In the vast majority of schools, including I believe all the schools in America and Canada, the teaching of Latin pronunciation is generally correct. And the same is true almost everywhere in Scotland, Ireland, Wales and England. That is, the system in use is based on the research of the last 60 years, from which we have learnt to know definitely what the Latin sounds really were like in the lifetime of Cicero. Let me give you some of the evidence. Please do not think that what I shall mention is anything like all. Not one lecture, but several courses would be needed for that. In one course, we should have to read a mass of Greek and Latin inscriptions and papyri, and in another, to study many volumes of the ancient grammarians, and a third would apply to Latin the methods of the scientific study of language, probably with some Sanskrit. Well, you will not do all this, but you should know that all this has been done by the scholars who have found the evidence of which I am going to tell you a little. But how can we know, you say, the sounds of a language no longer spoken? Well, there are more ways than you think. I suppose you have heard a sheep bleating. Did you ever hear a sheep say, be, be, be? Yet that is what the sheep must have said to the Romans if the old unreformed pronunciation were correct. Sheep say bear, bear, and the Greeks and Romans used their second vowel to write it with. If we believed the unreformed pronunciation, we should have to believe that an ancient cow mewed like a cat. But it is not altogether true to say that Latin is no longer spoken. We have a number of languages directly descended from Latin in which, although some sounds have changed under certain conditions by laws which have been ascertained, many other sounds have remained quite unchanged. Take some names of places still used on the same spot. There is a beautiful town on the edge of the mountains about 12 miles from Rome called Tivoli. Now the first syllable of that word, T, is exactly what it was in Latin. Tibore. In the old-fashioned English pronunciation, it was called Tibure. But the river on which Rome stands, which is called in Italian Tevere, was called in Latin Tiberem, the first syllable of which was short. The old pronunciation called that also Tiber. Here you have our English corruption creating a false and wholly needless confusion. If you travel to Rome, when you get out of the railway station, you find yourself in a place called Quirinale. In English, we call it the Quirinal. Which of the two pronunciations do you think is likely to be that of the Romans? That of those on the spot, or that used over here in England? The Romans, of course, called it Quirinalem. Again, when all the Romance languages agree in giving one value to a symbol, there is very strong probability that that sound was what it had in Latin itself. Otherwise, it is unlikely that it would have developed into precisely the same sound in several different languages. Right, uh, part two. 
of us, uh, record one of us two record sets. Uh, Latin pronunciation, uh, lecture by Professor R.S. Conway, and he was a professor of uh, at uh, Victoria University, Manchester. Oh, let's switch on first of all. Thus, in French, Spanish, Italian, and the rest, the first vowel is regularly that which we have in the first syllable in English of the words after and rather. In English, this vowel has been changed in most words and preserved only in special conditions when a sound like F or TH follows it. But we find this sound in the Italian farmer and the French farm and Spanish farmer. And we can be sure that they represent the sound of the Latin better than our English pronunciation of the word as fame, which has arisen since it was introduced into English from French. The sound that we modern English people give to this first vowel ought really to be written with two symbols, as in the word grey, for it is a diphthong, whereas the Latin sound was a pure vowel. Consider another kind of evidence. In modern Greek, the vowel still has the same sound, unchanged from ancient times. Now we have a mass of Latin words that were put into Greek because Greek was spoken at the same time as Latin was, Roman history was written by quite a number of Greeks, and Romans were mentioned in hundreds of Greek inscriptions. Thus the name, which if it were in English we should call Africanus, but which in Italian has become Africano, was written in Greek with the first vowel of the alphabet in the ending. That sound has survived to this day in Greek from the time when the hero himself was living and when his name came first to be written in Greek alphabet. Come nearer home. We find a number of words that were borrowed from Latin straight into the language of the Britons while the Romans were occupying this island before 400 AD. This language survives in Welsh. Now in Welsh the long first vowel of Latin becomes a long O. Thus the Welsh word hawk, which means peace, is derived from the Latin parkem. But if the sound in Latin had been what we give to the first vowel in modern English, we know from many other words that it would have become something quite different in Welsh. What about the third letter of our alphabet, the consonant which we call C? The great statesman whom in English we call Cicero always appears in Greek authors and Greek inscriptions written with two Ks. In Greek, down to this day, the letter K has the sound of English K so that no Greek has ever ceased to call that great man what he called himself, namely Cicero. Of course, the Greeks add the final N to make it a Greek nominative. Very similar evidence is in words which were borrowed from Latin into early German. The word which we call Sella, because it came to us through the French from the Latin Cellarius, Celarius, was borrowed into the German of what we call Austria at a very early time and so remains to this day, Keller. The Welsh word folk is interesting also from this point of view, because it shows how the second consonant in the Latin word parkem was sounded down to 400 AD. If it had had the sound of S as the letter has in English before the second vowel, it would have been written S in Welsh and could never have been sounded as it is today, like K in English. In Welsh, the letter C always means K because the Welsh borrowed it from Latin directly when it had that sound. Yes, don't forget that. Cicero, not Kikaro. Or Kikaro, not Cicero. <laughs> right, it's part three of this two record set, uh, two 12 inch uh, uh, shellac records. The International Educational Society lecture on Latin pronunciation by Professor R.S. Conway who was a professor uh, of uh, Latin at uh, Victoria University Manchester Again, we have evidence from Latin words taken into German which is precisely parallel to the evidence of words like Parkem taken into Welsh the German word kista still keeps the K sound which it had in Latin, kista, before it was borrowed into German. 
Although in English, coming through Norman French, the word has become chess. And our old friend the Kaiser would never have been so called, but that that name for an emperor was derived from the name of the person whom in English we call Augustus Caesar. But he called himself Augustus Kaiser. The German word has its K, has its diphthong, because it has both in Latin. If it had been called Caesar in Latin, it would have begun with an S in German. Our English form Caesar has come through the French, where C has become an S sound. We have quite another kind of evidence in the Latin grammarians, who discussed fully the sounds of all the letters. They give not the least hint of the change of C to any S sound until we come down to the 7th century AD, but then they do. In the 1st century AD, the greatest of all the grammarians, Quintilian, tells us that C is a letter whose sound is heard before all vowels, so that there is no need to write K anywhere. What reasonable person then conducts that to Quintilian, the sounds of C and K were exactly the same. And when you remember that in the English pronunciation, so-called, you have a perpetual change in the sound of the letter, so that, for example, the first person singular of the verb to say used to be called dico, and the imperative dic, but the second person singular was called dices, and the plural of the imperative dicete, with scores of other examples, it is impossible to believe that the Latin grammarians would not have commented on such a difference of sound if it had existed in their time. But in the 7th century AD, they do. They tell us then that in certain places, C had the sound of S. And in the same century, we begin to find on inscriptions the letter Z, written instead of the letter C, in such words as Pazze, P-A-Z-E, instead of Pazze. And that shows us when it was that this change began, namely in the 7th century AD. But then we cannot speak of Latin, because Latin by then had split up into a great many dialects which produced the Romance languages. Consider now how we know that the consonant which we call V was always pronounced in Latin as our W, down to the 2nd century AD, when it began to change. Our English words, wine, war, and wick in names of places like Ardwick and in the southern form witch, as in Aldwych, come straight from Latin words, weenum, wallum, and weekus, borrowed into Saxons and Danish, not only long before the Saxons and Danes invaded England, but before the W sound in Latin itself had changed, that is, before 150 AD. We're all familiar with the name of the Emperor Vespasian, as we call him. But he called himself Vespasianus. And when he wrote his name, as he did hundreds of times, in Greek letters, he began with the two vowel symbols O, U, Vespasianus. If he had lived a hundred years later, he would have probably begun with the Greek letter B, which then had a sound much like English V. We do get spelling. In Greek letters, Flabios, Pi, Lambda, Alpha, Beta, Iota, Omicron, Sigma, from the 2nd century AD and not before. Before that, we have Flauios. Right, the fourth and final part of this uh, fascinating uh, lecture on Latin pronunciation by Professor R.S. Conway of uh, Victoria University, Manchester. There is a well-known story of a bad omen that befell the old miser and moneylender Crassus, who because of his great wealth became the partner of Caesar and Pompey in the first triumvirate, and so was made consul in 55 BC. And then, finding himself consul, in late middle life he aspired to be a great military commander, and brought about one of the greatest disasters which any Roman army ever suffered when he was killed and his whole force annihilated by the Parthians at Cali in 53 BC. When Crassus was embarking his army for the east at Brundisium in 54 BC, he chanced upon a man in the street who was selling figs 
which came from the place in Asia Minor, which in English pronunciation would be called Kornos, but was then called Kaunos. His street cry was Kaunaos, figures from Kornos the same. He dwelt on it in a sing-song way, which sounded to Kratos' friends like Kawe Neos, don't go. Now, if the words of that phrase had been pronounced in Latin, as they used to be in English, Kavi Me Yes, the name of those figs would not have suggested the phrase to Cassus at all. But since the phrase was pronounced in Latin, Kawe Neos, you can see how close the resemblance was and how to Crassus' friends it appeared as a bad omen. You can see, too, how it was that the adjective tenuous was scanned, sometimes as three syllables and sometimes as two, tenuous. And the noun siloi, forest, was treated by Horace, sometimes as three syllables and sometimes as two. Siloi and tenuous only have to be pronounced slowly, and they become three syllables, siloi and tenuous. It only remains to ask, since we know the facts, whether we ought to use our knowledge or to behave as if we were ignorant. One reason for using the correct pronunciation is obvious from the examples with which we started. If the boy or girl learns to pronounce the Latin word animal correctly, he is not surprised to find the same sounds appearing in French animal, Italian animale. But if he is taught to pronounce it like the English animal, the sounds in the Romance languages puzzle him. One of the reasons why English boys used to pronounce French so horribly was because they were taught to pronounce their Latin just as if it was English. Nowadays, when they have learnt to say animal correctly in French, why should they say it wrongly in their Latin, taught perhaps in the next classroom and in the very next hour? A stronger reason is that the correct pronunciation makes Latin immensely easier to learn, if you do as the Romans did, and give one sound only to each letter. Saying, for instance, dico, dicit, dic, dicite. In the old pronunciation, who could tell what was meant by sedet? Any one of four quite different Latin words. One means, he is sitting down, and another, let him make things quiet, and another, he will give way, and the fourth, he will give someone a beating. Sedet, sedet, kedet, kaidet. These four are all perfectly distinct in the true pronunciation. The old pronunciation, too, made havoc of true quantities. Pater, as it was called, was sounded like later, instead of pata and mata from the start. It is simply cruel to a learner to teach him things that are not true, and which he has to spend time and trouble in unlearning. Magna est veritas, et trae relate.